The P-47 Thunderbolt earned its reputation as a rugged workhorse of the United States Army Air Force in World War II, striking down close to 4,000 enemy aircraft on more than 700,000 sorties. The success of this aircraft would solidify the status of Republic Aviation as a leader in aircraft manufacture and design, and ignite the career of its chief engineer, Alexander Kartveli. Kartveli, whose genius helped create the P-47, would shape a generation of ever more advanced aircraft, from the F-84 Thunderjet, to the F-105 Thunderjet, to the A-10 Thunderbolt II. Dr. Robert Sanator, a protege of Kartveli, was witness to this golden age at Republic as he worked his way up from designer to company president. In an exclusive interview, Dr. Sanator pays homage to the legacy of Alexander Kartveli and the aircraft he conceived for Republic. My first job at the Republic Aviation 1951 was as a junior engineer, which is an entry position for uh, young engineering graduates. And what responsibilities did you have? Very little. Mostly it was working under the supervision of others, and I began my career in the aerodynamics department. Republic was a great place to be. It was uh, staffed with uh, incredibly smart, in fact, brilliant people in all aspects of the uh, running of the business. It was led by strong people who gathered around them the best it was uh, in America. And uh, I learned a lot. I learned everything from the people I worked with over the years. I should say this, that at the time period of uh, when I started there, it was uh, filled with opportunity. It is different than today. There were many aviation companies in existence, and each of them had many projects. Uh, when I went to Republic in 1951, there were six active aircraft programs in being. So a person had the opportunity uh, to learn a lot about the different airplanes, to participate, and to really do engineering or whatever kind of work you wanted to do. There were many, many opportunities. Um, I worked on every one of those airplanes in the first year that I was there, from the uh, XF-91 to the straight-wing F-84s to the uh, F-105, to the XF-103, um, and the swept-wing versions of the F-84. I count them as about six programs that were moving simultaneously. There is no such thing that I know of today, and there certainly aren't very many aircraft companies uh, around in uh, the U.S. today. So in my own case, uh, within being there about six months, uh, I was asked to, of all things, to go and uh, get some wind tunnel testing done down at what was then NACA, is now NASA, in Langley Field, in their 7 by 10 foot tunnel of what became the uh, XF-84H, which was a turboprop uh, F-84. And there were some things that we needed to learn about uh, how to fly that airplane, so to get its aerodynamic characteristics. And I was given that opportunity to work with the NASA and NACA engineers, do the testing, collect all the data, and analyze what kind of uh, flying qualities this machine would have. Major de Seversky, as many people know, uh, was a Russian. He was a pilot, and uh, he flew uh, combat work in the uh, First World War. He uh, was involved in, I think, an explosion of some kind on the, in the airplane, 
and uh, lost his leg. Nevertheless, um, even with his wooden leg, De Seversky um, still proved to, uh, to his uh, superiors that he was a combat pilot. So I think that tells you something about an individual. The, uh, and so I admired that uh, in him. After the war, he started work with, I think, the SEV-3, which was an amphibian airplane. That was the uh, forerunner of all of the uh, Seversky airplanes that later became Republic airplanes. The P-35, the P-43, and ultimately the Thunderbolt, the P-47. Seversky was out of that uh, picture. That was Cardvelli. Cartvelli started to work with Major de Seversky sometime in the late 1920s. But of course, the company was formed in 1931, the Seversky, and uh, Alexander Cartvelli became the chief engineer and stayed with them. In 1939, the company became Republic Aviation. Uh, Major de Seversky was. Uh, um, taken out of his position because of uh, financial problems. Uh, and we moved on from there with the uh, different uh, derivatives of those airplanes up to the uh, Thunderbolt P-47, which was led, that one and many other aircraft, by Alexander Kartov. What, what I uh, can tell you about uh, Mr. Kartvelli is that he had a very good technical background. So he was a good mathematician. And uh, yet, um, a lot of it was feel. And it is, after all, engineering is an art. It is not a science. It is, at least I was trained in that concept. It is an art. Uh, if you stick only to the books and the numbers, you may not succeed. You need to have a feel for things. And he did. And, but he relied on the best information he could get from his uh, supporting team to use that feel to make it work. Some of the things I remember hearing about from um, Mr. Cartvelli were when the P-47 was put into service, it was clearly much bigger than the kind of aircraft that were flying there, such as uh, Spitfire. But it had certain characteristics that were very good. It had the ability to dive rapidly and to build up to very high speeds so that if it got onto an enemy's tail and it enemy decided to dive, he would get very far because the uh, P-47 was good at that. At Republic, right after the Second World War, there were a couple of directions that were being laid down. One was uh, trying to continue in the um, military aircraft field. Uh, with the straight-wing F-84s. The other side of it was trying to compete in um, the commercial field. Two aircraft uh, designs were put forward, one called CB, which was an interesting little airplane with a pusher prop and able to operate amphibiously. When I was teenage, there was a radio host named Arthur Godfrey, and he talked about the CB, which got my attention. And so I tried to find out what this was about, and it was uh, designed to be built for the consumer market with the concept that uh, many people would be returning from uh, military flight and might want to fly these little airplanes. There was a target cost of about $3,500 per airplane, which 
today would sound uh, to be incredulous. Uh, I think if their final price was about $6,000. The other airplane was called XF-12, which later became known as the Rainbow. And this was a beautiful design, a very, very streamlined airplane, 40 to 45 uh, passenger airplane that the uh, company was trying to offer to the Air Force. They then tried to sell it to the airlines, and there were some people who were interested in it. It never got bought. The orders for the, um, that, that company thought, that Republic thought, would be taken by Pan Am, TWA, others like that, did not materialize. So the project was dropped. On the military side, there was a great deal of activity on a whole family of F-84 aircraft, starting from the straight-wing F-84. At the same time, there was a XF-91 that used a lot of the components of the F-84, but put an inverse tapered wing of variable incidence. And the inverse tapered wing was designed in order to avoid what was called a saber dance, which was the F-100 saber having some problems with the tip stall. Um, that airplane was one of the first aircraft to go uh, supersonic or transonic to supersonic at sea level. It was, I think, the first. The airplane never went into production because it did not have the uh, range. At the same time, while these things were going on, the swept wing F-84s, both the F-84F, the RF-84F, and other F-84, Thunder Streets and Thunder Flash, and everything with Thunder was in progress. And uh, while I was doing wind tunnel work on the XF-84H, uh, at uh, Langley Field, um, there were these projects that were moving along. At the same time, the F-105 went into production in the early 1950s. So the time period is, over a period of several years, there were a large number of uh, things that grew out of the Thunderjet. It was amazing to me how from the P-47, the company under the direction of Alexander Clark Valley was able to make such a rapid move into jet aircraft. Many projects very quickly after the end of the um, Second World War. And one thing that uh, Mr. Clark Valley always uh, insisted on was low drag streamlined shapes. It had to be smooth, it had to look good, and his uh, opinions were that if it looked good, it would work well. So, uh, so they went from the Thunderbolt P-47 to a whole series of uh, aircraft with the um, prefix Thunder. The XF-103. Now this was a extremely novel concept. It was uh, an interceptor that would fly at uh, speeds in excess of Mach number 3.5. And it was a single place with a chin inlet for hypersonic speeds. And it would take the uh, turbojets that would convert to ramjets at high speed. Now that went to markup stage and uh, it had very, very thin wings, beautiful looking aircraft. Uh, one, one designer said those wings are meant for shaving because they were so razor sharp, right? Uh, and it was a, basically a Delta platform. And I think, I think at the time it was uh, in competition for the, for the role of interceptor against the uh, 102. But as the years went by, 
we, uh, the program was canceled at Republic in 57 or 58, 1957-1958. And what came out was something called A11, which became SR-71, the Blackbirds. And so that took the role of the uh, high altitude, high Mach number aircraft that the F-103 was moving toward. And of course, that was a black program. We never knew it existed, or at least I didn't. And uh, it was well understood why the 103 never uh, got lights. But I did wind tunnel work on the 103 in the early 50s, the usual aerodynamic characteristics and such. So that is the, uh, the breadth and extent of a large number of things that grew out of the uh, Thunder series. The F-105 was, as you guess, was initially started out to be a nuclear weapon carrier. And uh, there was initially, in the early F-105s, a large Bombay that was built into the airplane to carry what we used to refer to in our engineering language as a special store. A special store was a nuclear tipped piece of ordnance. Um, it was then determined somewhere along the line that this, of course we never used it, hope we never had to, and it was determined that really the F-105 uh, would not be required to do its initial mission, which was carrying the nuclear store internally. So it then got converted uh, into a ground attack airplane. And that large area that was in the Bombay, which was called by many of our people the ballroom, because it was a big area, got utilized for other equipment. And the airplane went through a whole family of changes from the initial A's to the B's to the D's to the F's and what ultimately F conversion into G's to Wild Weasel. And there were a total of 833 F-105s that were built by Republic. Superb design, great airplane. It got a reputation for requiring long runways because of relatively low power. But when the J-75s, particularly the Dash 19 engine, uh, became available, a lot of that uh, disappeared. But it had still the reputation and so got the moniker of uh, Thud. But the Thud was a great airplane. I told you before about Todd Belly's feeling about smoothness, slenderness, streamlined shapes, and it was true. Things worked, and uh, Republic made some very fast airplanes. And I'll tell you two things. One, uh, during the F-105 uh, program, uh, Richard Whitcomb of NACA had developed what he called transonic area rule. And the F-105 um, required, in order to satisfy the rule and make it go through the transonic speed zone more easily, what's known as a Coke bottle shape. Well, uh, when uh, Mr. Carvelli heard of that, he would have none of it. But um, he says, we are not putting Coke bottles on my F-105. But it um, turned out that when he saw the test data, changed his mind and allowed the Coke bottling to take place, although not totally as much as uh, uh, Richard Whitcomb suggested, but enough to do what it had to do. So he was able to step back from his beliefs when the facts proved them. And I think that's very important when you work with people. 
your, your uh, next in line are allowed to be heard and they're not afraid to be heard and they know that if they're right, sooner or later it will uh, come to pass. I think the sad part of uh, Republic's history was that the decision made by uh, Secretary of Defense McNamara to uh, not purchase the next planned set of F-105s, but to use the Navy's F-4. And I think around 63 or 64, around that time, was uh, very unfortunate. It took a great company and uh, put it on its knees. Uh, they went then in 1965 to be purchased by uh, Fairchild and fundamentally were supporting the F-105s in the field and doing subcontract work. And they lost a lot of their people, but they fortunately retained enough to win the A-10 and to give them another chance at that. The uh, TFX competition, which became the F-111, we were in that. We are in that. We didn't win that. Possibly we didn't win that. Don't know why. Um, maybe the, the concept was that they were, you know, the F-105 was going to phase out and then what were we going to do? So there were those years that the company just hung on and hung on and then was successful in uh, getting another chance at the A-10. I found that, that it, like many things in life, the, the object that wins the competition is not necessarily the best designed or the, or the logical winner. Mm -hmm. There are other aspects of the competition. That yes. Political being not the least of them. Oh, yes, and I think uh, uh, if we were to talk about uh, what causes an airplane to succeed with its customers or potential customers as opposed not to, as you uh, point out, there are um, many reasons, not necessarily which is the best design. And some of those reasons might be the uh, ability or, or ability of management to actually pull the job off. That's an important assessment factor. And um, it may well be political. There are all these things that come into it. Uh, our, our own belief at Republic during the F-15 program, um, and it's just our opinion. We don't know this to be a fact, but we had been told that we had a very good uh, F-15 proposal for its design work. And uh, I think the competition was running between our uh, Republic and General Dynamics. Um, I th that's my recollection of that. And almost apparently out of nowhere, um, in the final phases of this, McDonnell Douglas entered. And they had a fine airplane, but so did we. And I th we believed at the time that the uh, superior strength as perceived by the Air Force or the Pentagon of the McDonnell Douglas Corporation um, and, the, and its ability to manage the program was the reason that they were selected. The 8-9-A-10 was uh, the, were the two entries into the AX program, which was our first uh, foray into a fly-off. Now, uh, prototypes were built for fixed price. I think the public charged something like $40 million, but used a lot more than that to field um, two prototype A-10s. And similarly, Northrop fielded two A-9s. The first flight of our A-10 was in 16 months. So from the ward of contract to the first flight of our first prototype was uh, 16 months, which is what you even could do in 1970 
if it's undocumented prototype work, not a lot of paper. So these two airplanes were flown first by company pilots and then turned over to a team from the Air Force to go through a whole procedure in flight and in other logistics analyses, the whole ball of wax, to determine which one would be the winner. Uh, that was a different approach than the things that were done in the days of the other, other Thunder aircraft. The four aircraft, two from each company, were flown at, uh, over a period of many months at Edwards Air Force Base. Were you present? Oh, yes. And, and so, was this a nail-biting time? Oh, absolutely. Well, tell me about that. Well, the, the first nail-biting time is after 16 months when our um, chief test pilot took the airplane off, right? You, Sam Nelson was the uh, pilot, and uh, he, had, he had done simulator work. I went with Sam to Moffett Field in California where they had a large uh, mobile simulator where we put the characteristics of RA-10 in there, and he got uh, practice in flying the airplane by a simulator. Well, they took it off, and that was a gear down test. We did not collapse the, or retract the gear during that test, and seemed to behave the way, at least in those low speed flights, the way we intended to. So that, I think, is the first nail biter. Oh, first flights are like that, you know. Right, will it fly? <laughs> yeah, and um, we had an incident in, uh, as the, as the testing went on, we had two prototypes, right? And one of the young captains, fine man, uh, always liked him, he landed the, uh, one of our prototypes in, uh, in a controlled crash. In other words, I, I think that uh, he accepted the blame for judgment, and I think he blew out the tires, right? When you blow out the tires on an airplane, bad things happen, and you do some damage. But uh, we had some really good engineers who went out and fixed that airplane. And it was back in the air in a matter of maybe weeks, see? I know that the uh, young captain that flew it got out of the airplane and threw his helmet on the ground. He was so upset of what happened that put us at a potential disadvantage, you know. But it's the kind of people that work for the Air Force, the kind of people that we had that, let's just go fix it and go on from here. For a while I was preliminary design manager and I was responsible for leading our engineers and manufacturing people uh, in design of our airplane. And it's pretty ugly. And Mr. Cartbelly, the biggest part about it that he really was unhappy with was the wing selection in terms of, of its thickness and camber. And uh, that was selected in order to meet a low speed maneuvering requirement, a sustained maneuvering requirement that about 150 knots. So, Mr. Carvelli, of course, had been working up in high mark numbers. Speed was everything. So we had many debates, he and I, about uh, thin wing, thick wing, and all that. Um, we never really resolved it. However, when the contract was awarded to the uh, Republic over Northrop, Hopefully that means we had a superior airplane and all things consumed. And it met the requirements, but it was designed to meet the requirements. He came to me and he said, Monsieur Lusanato, you were right. I, I mean, I will never, ever forget that. What would you say his legacy is? 
Well, the legacy that uh, Mr. Cartvelli uh, would uh, be responsible for is the entire family of aircraft, and it's substantial. Many different kinds of airplanes developing from the technology of the 20s and the 30s right up until the uh, 70s. And to a historian or someone who visits the museums and looks up the aircraft, his uh, fingerprints are all over them. Republic's airplanes have been used in many different ways. Mr. Cartvelli's designs from the B-47 Thunderbolt and the Thunder series right up to Thunderbolt II have a linkage. And the linkage comes from all of the uh, engineering talent that grew in that time period. People that worked on the AX or A-10 for us were there years before and learned about ground attack and close air support and how to design things. So one could see that the Thunderbolt II uh, is generated out of the long history reaching back to the original Thunderbolt. From the aerodynamics work, which I did uh, for eight, nine years, then more project work, uh, working on the aerospace plane, on hypersonic vehicles, uh, the F-15 uh, project, uh, which was our proposal, that was eventually gone to McDonnell Douglas. And of course, uh, I was a principal on the AX competition, which pitted uh, Northrop's A9 against the uh, Republic, Fairchild Republic A10. And I spent a lot of time first as the chief technical engineer on that A10 or AX, and uh, then as the deputy program manager when it became a development and production, full scale development. And went from there to senior vice president of the uh, company dealing with technology and business administration, business development, sorry. And then was fortunate enough to be selected to uh, become president. So that in a nutshell takes care of 35 years of uh, involvement with Republic. What are you most proud of? I think the things that stay in my mind, the one thing that stays in my mind uh, is the A-10 program because that was bringing the uh, company back from the grave. In 1970 dollars, it is a program that brought five billion dollars, which is not much these days, but in 1970 it was a lot of money for a program that provided uh, work, opportunity for development, and more chances uh, to succeed. So. That is the single most important impact on me and what the, the most important memories I have. Summing up, I would say that uh, the story of Republic Aviation uh, is a great story and that it uh, covered the waterfront. It was a leader. It starts out as uh, something that you've trained for all your life, trying to make a difference. The cool thing is, as an A-10 pilot, on times when the stars align and you're up on that mission, 
uh, where you get to make a difference, you get to see the reward. It's a pretty easy answer to in terms of why are we here. Number one priority is always saving guys on the ground. The people that we uh, so closely work with, the, the guy on the ground. That's my whole soul and being is that guy on the ground. Uh, you know, he could be an 18 year old guy, 18 year old kid with a rifle. That's all he's got and I'm here to protect him. Sanitized dog tags, ID card, and left breast pocket, uni kit, watch tape, smart pack, in-flight guides, maps, DTCs, RMMs. Uh, let's see, visor, fiddle packs, water, snacks, seat cushion if you guys want to take that. Uh, Cell phones, you got one, do you have yours, okay, signed up. Yep. One random Friday, uh, spring of 03, so right after the, uh, uh, the Iraqi invasion, uh, three guys in flight suits walked into the bar on campus and started talking about flying. And I was a year away from graduating, not really knowing what I wanted to do in life. And then this guy started talking about flying fighters and uh, being a fighter pilot and being in the Air Force and how awesome it was. And uh, it kind of uh, hit, hit a nerve with me, if you will. Attack! All right, attack, man. Go Chuck. How I got interested in the A-10, uh, I can still remember it to this day. Uh, it, I was at a... Uh, uh, a hobby store because I like a lot of kids interested in aviation I built a lot of airplane models and this was 1979 I was in in high school and went to the hobby store and they had a Ravel model of the the for then brand new A-10 uh, it, it had only been operational for a couple of years at that point and I just saw and I remember I can still remember to this day looking at the the wall of models and just trying to pick what I was going to build next and I saw this the box and the picture and I was like what in the world is that during about the last month of pilot training is where you put in for what airplanes you want to fly. And I was torn on the F-15E or the A-10 on which one I wanted to put number one on my list, you know. So luckily, uh, uh, one of the respected IPs in our flight had flown both the A-10 and the F-15E. And all he said to me was, Mitchell, what patch do I wear on my shoulder on Fridays? And the patch he always had on was the A-10. So. I ended up putting the A-10 as number one, uh, and I loved the mission, the thought of the mission at the time. And I was a uh, first lieutenant, uh, I was 26 years old uh, when, when Desert Storm kicked off. The 26-year-old fighter pilot caught the nation's attention a few months ago when he and a partner shot down a record number of Iraqi tanks. You just never forget when you look down and realize that somebody's trying to shoot you down and you've got to, to, uh, to kill him first. My first uh, full two years in the Air Force, it was pretty much a completely Cold War type of uh, mentality. Our training was all very low altitude. Um, it, it's, uh, it doesn't seem that long ago to me, but uh, I know talking to a lot of the guys now, you know, they're, it, it, it's uh, been quite a while ago. And, and when you look at the airplane from then to now, it's, it's pretty amazing the different upgrades and, uh, that we've gone through since then. The A-10 is the only airframe ever that was built entirely for this mission. Yo, come on, man. They're about to do a gun run. You need to get down. Let's go, buddy. Come on, man. Saving the day again, baby. <laughs> There's just nothing that matches uh, the devastation that that gun can uh, can bring. Oh, 
Optic for the pull off. 30 mil inbound! It's an awesome testament to the to the aircraft, I think, that, that the same gun that we used to kill main battle tanks in 1991 is the same gun where uh, we can shoot a single insurgent uh, that's fleeing on a, on a motorcycle or, uh, or uh, shooting our, at our guys from a, uh, from a tree line. Point is, you know, the A-10 was built for ground combat, okay? Ground combat has, we had the old linear battlefield type where we're going to go fight a bunch of tanks going low at 100 feet and then we've morphed into a medium altitude precision strike platform because the airplane has been updated and modified to be able to do that. Sensors are great, they're amazing, they, they enable precision strike, they enable us to generate coordinates that, that are pristine, that are right on the target, but that will never replace just you know looking right outside of my cockpit and looking at the battle space. What am I seeing out there big picture? We do have this personal connection with the people that we uh, so closely work with, the, the guy on the ground. Uh, we hear uh, him getting scared. Request immediate re attack, same remarks, same restrictions, from last hit, north 75 meters. We hear him getting excited. We Here we go, that's it. Good hit, good hit, good hit. Dash 2, I need you in the same, same remarks, same restrictions. We hear the bullets flying. We hear him taking cover, we hear him breathing hard. Uh, and and it's, it's, it becomes a very personal, uh, a very personal mission, uh, especially when, when you start hearing about guys uh, taking casualties uh, down there. You take that, you know, that hits very, very close to home. Nobody ever wants to hear that. We care about guys on the ground. We do our mission in relationship to guys on the ground. We are support element, essentially, for the Army. We care about the guy on the ground. I'm not saying air addiction mission isn't caring about the guy on the ground, but it's not tangible. You can't really grab the benefits of it right then. You're gonna wait a certain amount of time to see its effects. Air to air, how's that about the guy on the ground? Well, you're building air superiority, air supremacy, correct. But is the guy on the ground gonna see it, get the tangible benefits of it? No. Close air support is about the guy on the ground. Combat search and rescue is about the guy on the ground. Um, we're joint. We're a joint airframe and an air force, and that's what makes us different. Okay, uh, today we're going down to Sande Sufla. We've been there recently, so we've got a good lay of the land. Um, keep in mind, the spiny's been pretty hot recently, and they've had some contact from the same area around Sande Sufla. Uh, he went over the recent activity. Keep in mind the uh, kind of MO we've had recently out of there. They've seen the, the Taliban commander kind of looking at the objective first, doing a quick meeting, picking up weapons en route. Usually there's motorcycles involved. Uh, you've also got the uh, Taliban commander that they uh, seeked a couple weeks ago. So you've got all that stuff going on right there in Aspandi. We're going right into the heat of that. So keep that in mind as, uh, as we get down there. Keep your eyes open and uh, stay vigilant. All right, so our actions on contact, near and far ambush, return fire. Look to me, we'll either maneuver or we'll push through. IED, get 360 degree security and clear the danger area. And then we'll look to Kazavak. Uh, in the case of a complex attack, we're going to return fire, move out of the kill zone. Indirect fire, get down, look for uh, distance and direction from me. Our actions on halt, take a knee, face out, and uh, the march intervals that we're going to use are going to be dependent on where we are uh, in the open area, spread out as much as you can. The bigger we can look and the more intimidated we can look, the uh, less likely we're going to take contact as we move down there. That's all I've got. What are your questions?
All right, we're kidding up. It's 0615. 0615, kids on. Shit, didn't say anything about her. Yesterday, as most days, we went out on a dismounted patrol uh, south of our FOB to a village of Espondi. Uh, basically, we got some intel that uh, some bad guys were storing weapons in a building, and we had contacted them before. We'd run into them before. So we went down there to kind of check back up. And uh, as we got down into the village, um, we ran into some, some sketchy guys. It just, everything felt weird from the time we got down there. There was high tension. You could tell by the, the NA's body language. He was antsy, pacing back and forth. The second that happened, we, we know we spread out, let the, the PL do his link up. Uh, it was just high tension, I felt from, from the get go. I said everybody is the teachers here, so we are good people. Okay, if they're good people, they have nothing to worry about. We're not. We're not. Uh, just a lot of a lot of uh, sketchy reports. No one had uh, the same same story. Everyone, they were all family. They all lived in the same compound, but no one's story matched up. Unfortunately, we weren't able to detain them. Um, so as we started to uh, to RTB to head back to the base, um, we got word that the Taliban were maneuvering on us from the south. Again, Be advised right now, uh, we're uh, picking up and moving back uh, through Esponde uh, towards uh, Ghazni. Mutant enter, go. <laughs> So, that way. And uh, Hog, if I could get you uh, overhead of our uh, lead element uh, through a spondy, if uh, at all possible. As we were headed back to the base, we had to cross about two kilometers of open desert. We were definitely in a, a huge open danger area. We got about 500 meters outside of the village and started taking uh, some pretty accurate fire. Two seven, send it. Oh, three, come on, fucking hang it. Hang it. Hang it. I hanged it. Right, shoot it. Right, fire. Fire. Shoot it. There was no cover. I mean, there were people trying to find tire tracks to hide, to get a little bit of a defilade behind. Uh, you know, in, in that position, the best you can do is 
spread out, gain fire superiority, you know, and then wait for, for some air support. Our comms were a bit of an issue at the time, and so they had a little bit of a struggle, uh, but they did have uh, A-10s luckily being pushed down to us. I have your position south of the tree line. We re quickly responded and uh, working with the JFO on the ground and, and uh, one of my JTACs were able to get Hog on, on station quite quickly. We were taking some harassing fire at that point. Right here. Hey man, I'm busy, but I need full security, brother. Who's Eli, shooting? Bro. Somebody's fucking shooting at us still. Uh, but luckily we had uh, the A-10s on station to uh, come in and do a nice show of force, which is always a, uh, a clincher for the enemy because they know what that entails. The A-10 has proven itself time and again as being um, really a nightmare to the enemy. Just its mere presence alone is enough to, get, uh, to keep the enemy at bay. And, uh, and in that situation right there, uh, again, just bringing those guys in quick and fast um, uh, was enough to push, uh, push the enemy uh, away from our forces. The ground troops that I work with, uh, when they think close air support, they think A-10s. And I think the reason for that is uh, they almost share the same mentality. Um, if you were to say that there's a grunt in the sky, it'd be a hog pilot. They're very user friendly. I mean, any one of these dudes could pick up the radio if I get shot in the face and, uh, you know, employ. Those guys are really professional, very well trained. And if, uh, you know, you have a random Joe who doesn't know what to do, those, those guys can pull it from them. To win a war, you need boots on the ground. And to have boots on the ground, you need support. And you need the right kind of support to have boots on the ground. And it's the A-10, honestly. Even sometimes just the sound. Or just telling the ground commander, hey, A-10's on its way, or we have aircraft support, and then we hear five mics. And he asks what it is. You say, hey, we've got an A-10 coming on. It's, it's, it's uh, yeah, it, it picks them up a little bit. That sound is so distinguishable literally shakes the ground. It is amazing. Uh, you hear it at first when it fires and then you hear it echo from the gun in the sky. It, it, that sound right there just drives 11 Bravo is nuts. It's amazing. Hey, thanks sir. I just shit my pants. <laughs> It's that sound of uh, uh, <laughs> corny like freedom, but it, it really is. It's just, it's the sound of don't mess with me. It, it scares off everyone and shows you you're in good hands. I think when people 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years down the road look back on it, I think people will look at this airframe and it will always be known as an airframe that was, some people view it as ugly, who'd want to fly that thing, but you know what, it was an airframe that got the job done, it got bombs on target when it mattered most, and guys went home to their wives and kids because of the airframe. It, it makes it, uh, it's very humbling. It's that. Uh, we are so trusted and, and liked by the ground forces. I think that's something that uh, I'm very, very proud of. They love this airplane uh, and, and uh, they trust us is the biggest thing. I mean, when you're shooting last night, uh, we just looked at it, it was uh, between 65 and 100 meters away from the, from the friendly guys. And for those guys to, to trust us uh, to do that uh, on a regular basis uh, is, uh, is very gratifying. I got the greatest job in the world, man. I get to fly fighters when, uh, when people need me to do my job. I had the chance to save lives uh, and, and make a difference on the battlefield. Um, that is the mo when you when you hear the, the machine guns going off in the background, when JTAG's screaming, the bullets are hitting in his feet, 
and you can hear the bullets pinging off the Humvee that he's hiding behind. Uh, and then all of a sudden you roll in, uh, you know, put some rounds down and take care of his problem for him. Uh, and then, you know, you can hear the relief in his voice. That is the most rewarding and fulfilling thing that I can think of. You've got a huge group of experts at what they do with a singular focus. And you can't really get that back once it's broken out. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching. There's no doubt that if Colonel Bob Dilger hadn't been there, the A-10 would have been a real failure. He saved the cannon program, basically by being a bull in a china shop. Colonel Dilger, a great fighter pilot who had been one of the best fighter instructors, he was an air-to-air -air type, you know, silk star kind of guy, a brilliant tactician, had been one of the best instructors at Nellis Air Force Base's Fighter Weapons School, which was the ancestor of the Navy's Top Gun, was doing that kind of work long before the Navy ever thought of doing Top Gun. And he, peculiarly enough, and kind of against his wishes, because <laughs> he really wanted to just fly airplanes and shoot down other people, right? And which, we, by the way, he did in the Vietnam War. He was a brilliant flight leader in the Vietnam War, one of the best. He wound up in a bureaucracy, and this was a guy who really hated bureaucracies, right at Wright-Patterson, and got himself assigned to be head of the 30 millimeter program. And beyond the shadow of a doubt, if he hadn't been there, I mean, simply no other guy could have accomplished the job that needed to be done. When Dilger was handed this assignment, you're now the project manager for the cannon. They really handed him a bag of worms. He didn't know that, of course. He just stepped and looked at it. The first thing he saw that was real obvious was the engineers had already estimated that the round would cost over $100, something like $105 a piece. If you stop and think about that, that's a deal breaker. Because if you're going to have a cannon, you have to have war reserve ammunition. You're talking about millions of rounds of ammunition. You know, if you're going to rely on a cannon, and you're going to carry 20 passes worth of ammunition in every sortie. If you can't have a stockpile of weapons, of ammunition, that'll last you at least 30 days, you know, you might as well not go to war. And at 100 or $105 a round, this was hopeless. You could eat up, you know, the budget for a major fighter just buying ammunition. And he looked at it and of course, being, you know, a total non-bureaucrat himself, he looked at it and he said, this is hogwash. He said, I can do it for a tenth that. And he came very close to it. 
he actually delivered the round, a round that everybody had told him all the cost estimators said would cost $105 a piece. He delivered it for $13 a piece. And to do that, he had to trample over every ordinance bureaucracy <laughs> in the Air Force. I mean, it was amazing. It was amazing. But he, he turned out to have a natural knack for production engineering, and he knew how to pick people who were great production engineers. The packaging was a huge amount of the cost. The brass case was a huge amount. He innovated aluminum cases to save money. He just saved nickels and dimes everywhere, and all of them violating some military specification and some bureaucrat behind that military specification. He went through them. Like, a, like the Mongol army. <laughs> Not only did he do that, but being naturally suspicious of, you know, purely theoretical engineering, he said, we've got to test it every step of the way. And the Air Force was prepared at that point to simply, you know, fire the gun a lot on the ground, which is traditionally what, you know, army and Air Force gun guys do. And if it fired pretty well, fine, it's qualified to go, go fly with the airplane. It'll be fine. Pilger didn't believe that. He believed, very rightly, that the things that happen when you fire an airplane off an airplane that are not the same as firing it off a cast iron mount, you know, at Fort Huachuca or something. <laughs> so he demanded airborne tests. And furthermore, he wasn't really sure that we were right about how lethal this thing was. I mean, we'd done a fair amount of ground firing at pieces of armor and even at armor with gas cans behind it and stuff like that. But that's not the same as firing at the real deal. So he devised a program <laughs> under a wonderful cover name. It was called the LAVP, the Lot Ammunition Verification Program which was to fly real A-10s with real cannons and real ammunition and shoot them at real Soviet tanks. And he scoured up money out of the most in improbable places. He got a lot of stuff for free just by kind of horse trading. You know, this, this, this is the kind of thing that, that fighter pilots and fighter maintenance people are really good at, is, you know, this kind of black market kind of wheeling and dealing. He found somebody in the intelligence community who was importing tanks, you know, Soviet tanks under very high classification because nobody wanted to reveal who we were buying them from. But there were various satellite nations who had Soviet tanks and, who, you know, who'd have a general that could be bribed and you could buy some tanks from him, right? And it turned out this organization was so effective that they were getting far more tanks than anybody needed. In fact, they didn't know what to do with them. And somehow he wangled an authorization, probably illegally, to get a bunch of these tanks. And then he got a bunch of cast-off M48 army tanks that they no longer wanted. He assembled the fifth largest tank army in the world. He had close to 400 tanks out in the desert in Nevada, he'd even wangled some Marine maintenance battalion. Somehow he got next to them to fix his tanks, because he said these tanks have to be loaded with ammunition, they have to have fuel in them, they have to have oil in them, and they have to have engines that can run, right? Otherwise they're not real targets because of the issue of fire. Fire is so important, you fire at some dead tank, you don't know whether you're going to light it on fire or not, right? So out in the desert, <laughs> outside Nellis Air Force Base, he assembled the fifth largest tank army in the world for live A-10s to come in and shoot at. We learned so much from that program. The first thing we learned was that if we had sent the cannon to combat with this approved ammunition and everything, it would have failed the first day of combat because there were some real problems with, first of all, the gun gases were, in fact, obscuring the vision of the pilot. Secondly, they were causing the engine to fail. There such huge gun gas being developed out at the muzzle that was blowing straight back into the engines behind the cockpit. They were actually causing engines to shut down, to have compressor stalls and all this kind of thing. But once you had made your live firing passes, the very first ones, the problems were real obvious. He got on it. He changed the formulation of the, of the propellant a little to reduce the smoke. 
They've got a different deflector for the muzzle gases so that the gases wouldn't go into the engine. And thank God, we're able to solve those problems, but only because we'd had that fifth largest tank army to shoot at. And by the way, he installed cameras inside the tank so you could see the inside effects. They counted up kills very meticulously, and by the way, fixed the tanks again and shot at them again. And we found out the cannon was devastatingly lethal, much more lethal than any anti-tank weapon available up to that time, much more lethal than the computer models had predicted because the fire was so devastating. And we were getting like tank kills of well over 60% per pass, which was astonishing. The upshot was that this really brilliant, mostly illegal, <laughs> terrifically opposed program saved the whole A-10. And by the way, its after effects still exist today because out of that, the military reform movement of which I was a part, realized the importance of live fire testing, of testing at real targets with real ammunition. And that became legislated as part of the operational test legislation that created the office of the operational test and evaluation director, the, who exists to this day, who oversees all that. He has a special responsibility in the legislation for seeing that every vehicle, platform, ship, airplane that carries American military people is tested with live enemy ammunition to make sure the people inside can survive. If it wasn't for Dilger's stolen tank army, the entire A-10 program would have been a failure, and we would have never had the live fire testing that we have today demanded by the Congress.